Welcome to 90% Knitting. This is episode 291. I am Lisa, also known as Fibernoom. I'll go ahead and put my screen in here so you can see where you can find me on social media and how to email me. Okay, so today is Wednesday. It is August 8th. We are two days away from the double digits of August and that is wrong and I need it to stop because I've got a lot of things I'd like to do before summer is over and the month is moving too quickly. So if you are in charge of that, can you please just slow the month down for me a little bit? I would appreciate that. Yep, thank you. <sighs> How are you today? I opted to record inside because number one, it's after, it's afternoon. It's after like 12 o'clock. It's like 1230 right now. And the sun is actually out at the moment. It was not out earlier. It was very overcast. I really thought it was going to rain. It was sort of thundery, but it did not rain. We are supposed to get hammered with rain later this afternoon. But anyway, at this point, the sun's too far over the house and it would be very, very bright and not pleasant so we're inside which is fine because there's a really nice breeze coming through here right now i also moved the camera back a little bit this week because sometimes i feel like when i have it set up closer i feel like you guys are right in my face plus when i have the camera closer and i'm wearing an open shirt like this it sometimes almost looks like i don't have a shirt on and we don't want to go there so camera's back a little bit. Hopefully I'll be able to show you things a little bit better. I am going to talk about my shirt a little bit later because I made it. I'm really happy with it too. But anyway, let's get started with some knitting because that's why we're here, right? Yes, that is why we're here. Knitting and the other crafty goodness. I've got some finished objects to show you. And the first one is the sock plank, uh, sock plank socks, the ones I've been knitting for months because they were samples um, they were like my demonstration socks for shows. I can demonstrate to people what sock blanks are all about if I'm knitting on a sock blank during the show. So this is my most recent pair for that purpose and they are now finished. Um, all my sock blanks are pretty much one of a kinds, even if they have the same general design. Like I do rep repeated designs like the fireworks ones and the, oh, what other ones have I done? the Whoville blanks. They, they're like the general thing is the same, but the expanded rainbow blanks, things like that. Um, but they all are going to end up being a little bit different. So this is one that I is obviously, it was a resist blank and actually here's like a tiny little bit of it left. So that's what it looked like. And this is how it knit up. And I just think it's so cool because like this one did this little bit of stripey stuff right here. See the colors this was one of my sparkle blanks so it's my happenstance with sparkle and I really like them my husband has claimed them believe it or not <laughs> not long ago well not long ago probably a few months ago um, well before I started I think I started these in April um, we had talked and he had mentioned yeah he would totally wear sparkly socks so I'm like okay so this blank was largely red I mean, there was a lot of red and orange in it, which are colors he likes. There's also pink, which he doesn't like. But um, I showed him the finished socks because I, I knit them specifically. I made the cuffs longer because he likes a longer cuff. These are, oh gosh, probably, I would say close to eight inches. Maybe, well, no, seven, seven to eight inches long. And I did a ribbed cuff because he likes ribbing in the cuffs as opposed to a stockinette cuff. Um, so I did them thinking if, if he decides he wants them, he can have them, and otherwise I would wear them because our foot length is about the same. His is maybe a half an inch longer than mine, but I usually make my socks, I try to make my socks like with a little bit of extra wiggle room in the toes, so they would work for either of us. So I showed them to him this morning, and I'm like, you know, do you want these? You said you'd wear sparkly socks, and he's like, yeah, I'd wear those. So he's like, I'm not today. I'm not going to put them on. I'm like, well, no, not today. But anyway, so yeah, my husband has claimed these sparkly socks and all right. So I would have liked them for myself, but I actually have another sock blank in waiting that I think I'm going to, that'll be my next one to start. 
um, to knit on it shows, and that one will be mine because I really like it. So anyway, I like it too. My next finished object is one that you haven't seen even started, but I did mention it last week. It's a mitt, um, a mitt pattern. And I, oh, there's an end in here that I apparently didn't didn't weave in or didn't trim one or the other. We'll just tuck it down in there, okay? Um, I told you last week that I was going to be doing a test knit for Sarah Jordan, who is PA Knitwit. And she, I had actually approached her asking her if she would be interested in doing a design with a set of my inversibles. And I specifically wanted a design that wasn't socks because that's what people usually think of with my inversibles is knitting socks and it's great but you can do so many other things with inversibles and that's what I really wanted to be able to showcase and so she designed a mitt pattern and that is what these are and so I, I did kind of an unofficial test knit for her the pattern has not been released yet it's still in testing um, but it will be released hopefully soon and uh, the pattern will be called the deco lace mitts and this is what they look like. I just think they're really cool and hey do you remember a couple weeks ago I showed you the mitten blockers that I bought from Burning Impressions? They were really cool right and they would be excellent for me to show you these. I can't find them. I do not have any idea where they are. I have looked in every logical place they could possibly be and they're not there. I don't know where they're at. That means I put them someplace where I thought, oh, this is a good spot for them. No idea. I also have about three or four sets of Haya Haya sock needles that I purchased because I bought a bunch of them. Remember, I told you about that too. I bought a bunch of Haya Haya sock needles several months ago. I know exactly where they have been sitting for most of those months, which is on this, it's on a bin next to my desk. I kind of use it as a side table. They've been sitting there in a stack. I can't find them. I don't know where in the heck they are. It's infuriating and it makes me worry a little bit for my brain because it's like these things were here. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so I have to show you these mitts on my hands because I do not have the blockers. But I have to show them to you in my hands so the lace is opened up. Um, it's just a really fun pattern to do. It was pretty intuitive like by the time I got to the second mitt I really wasn't even looking at the chart very much she has the directions written out both in chart and written out um, this was the first mitt I did and there is one error that was user error the pattern is wonderful Sarah's patterns I say this all the time she writes wonderful patterns um, she's an excellent designer I love her patterns and you know her patterns are very professionally done she gets them tech edited and tested and they're just wonderful so any errors in these mitts are completely user error on my part <laughs> so yeah I don't know what I did right here because whenever I was all and I didn't notice it until I was finished with the mitt all I had to do was the thumb and I saw it I'm like that's not right and so I tried to fix it because the this wasn't together this is like a vertical a double vertical decrease or whatever that is um, at the top of each lace panel and or repeat and I hadn't I had done it but it hadn't pulled the two pieces together it was almost like I did the row that had this eyelet and then I did I did that vertical double decrease in another row but not pulling those together. I don't know. I don't know what I did. So I basically just took a piece of yarn with a, you know, a tapestry needle and kind of pulled it together. <laughs> so it closed it up and it made it look like it was in the right place. That vertical double decrease was in the right place. And it does look pretty, I mean, you have to really kind of look, I think any like average person is not going to look at this and say, Oh, there's an error. You know, Sarah would be able to pick it out and maybe you're one of you, but I don't think anybody else is going to see it. Um, but I can see it and it's funny because these this motif kind of looks like moths small moths to me and so that one almost looks like there's like antennas out of the moths but whatever it's minor I'm not worried about it um, yeah anyway it's really cool they have thumb gusset you do work a thumb gusset in there and then you know knit your 
knit your thumb and I was able to get these to be super matchy with the stripes. Um, obviously the colors don't match but because they're inversibles but the inverse size of the stripes matched up super well. I bound off with that last round of just the other color. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> it's the little things folks. So anyway my deco lace mitts are ready to be a sample at my shows which is awesome um i will probably even if i do find my mitt blockers i will probably not use those at shows i'll probably make some sort of a blocker to put inside of these though to show off that lace patterning better but um yeah they're just really fun the pair she did she did out of a cherry and a light um it was a lavender gray. It was kind of a fluky colorway that I ended up doing. I'll have to figure out how to re do it again though since she knit hers out of them. Um, but in her pictures of the mitts, it almost just looks like an optical illusion. Like the lace, the lace combined with the small stripes in the inversibles almost gives an illusion of movement. Um, I noticed that more in her set than in mine, but you can actually see it more in this one, I think. I just think it gives it like this motion, this illusion of motion. So I don't know. I, they're cool, and I, I'm, I love the pattern, um, and I'm really happy that Sarah decided to do that for me. So I appreciate, I love working with Sarah. I love collaborating with Sarah. She's a wonderful designer to work with. So anyway, I'll stop gushing, but... That's my other finished object for this week, and I will definitely be letting you know when these mitts come out. I plan to put together kits for them. Um, yeah, I'll tell you more about them later on once that happens. So, Anyway, <laughs> those are my two finished objects. Um, let's see, works in progress. I did work on, let's see, where's the bag? Um, my one project that I told you that I pulled out of my hibernation bin um, to use as a gift was the big squish cowl that is sort of a design that I'm working on. Um, I, I knit one last summer out of my own yarn, but it was not as long, and so I wanted to do a longer version, so I'm doing that out of some destination yarn, um, which the multicolor here is called Fall Run, and I love this colorway. I just think it's a fabulous colorway. And then this is, I believe, pine green. Um, let's see, pine forest. And they are both on her DK weight, which is a 100% superwash merino wool, 231 yards. So it's pretty much the same as my DK weight. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So I am into the place where I'm combining both colors. So this is a two by two rib down here. And then there's some different stitching that goes on in here. You can't see it super well right now. I'm still sort of playing around with how wide I want these stripes to be, which is why the one looks different than the other at the moment. But it's sort of, this is my design process. I usually design on the fly as I'm knitting. Like I have an idea of what I want to do and then I work it out as I go. So at any rate, I'm planning for this to be a Christmas gift for my girlfriend because she loves these colors too, so I think she'll enjoy this. Um, yeah, so just working on that. US 5 Needles, my um, dreams, Knitter's Pride dreams. I really like these wooden needles. So I put some work into that. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, socks. I did work on more socks. I'm always working on socks. Um, so the sample socks that I showed you for the new colorways from last week, which by the way, if you shopped my update last week, thank you so much for your enthusiasm over this new soft side collection of colorways. Um, I'll talk more about that in the show news or the shop news segment, but thank you. Um, so this is my sample sock. So I have added a few more stripes. I've kind of slowed down because I wasn't quite sure what heel I wanted to do in this. Um, my go-to for most stripey socks is an afterthought heel so that I can preserve the stripes. 
but I actually think what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to do a non-Euclidean heel. I haven't done that heel yet. That is another um, pattern by Sarah Jordan. She came out with the non that's sorry, muffins in here. She just shook and rattled her collar. Um, yeah, Sarah Jordan came out with the non-Euclidean heel, and then she did the CPCTC congruent parts of congruent triangles are congruent sock pattern, which is the same pattern except toe up, um, which we just had a drawing for not too long ago. So you probably would remember hearing about that. Um, so yeah, I think I'm going to try the non-Euclidean heel in these because if I remember correctly, it does not disrupt the striping pattern, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah. Um, I haven't looked at it lately, so it's sitting on my desk. I know where it is. I had it printed out and it's been sitting on my desk waiting to be used. So yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do with this. So I am pretty much at a point where I'm ready to put in the heel because these are actually quite long as well. I'm knitting this on Heavenly, which is my MCN base. Um, which I don't usually knit socks out of MCN very often, but I just thought these soft colors really would go well with that. So I did dye up a couple of the colorways on MCN, and this was one of them. So, And again, US1 needles in my whale bag. From a bag maker who's no longer making bags so I won't bother to tell you the deets on that <laughs> so there's that sock and then lastly I did cast on a new pair of socks because I finished two projects that were on sock needles and you can't have two empty sets of sock needles sitting around even though I have multiple sets of empty needles sitting around that I can't find but we won't talk about that anymore so yes, I cast on a pair of socks um, that will also be a Christmas present or a birthday present. These are for my middle child, my younger son, <laughs> the 23-year-old. Um, his birthday is at the beginning of December, so it could go either way as far as a birthday or a Christmas gift. But he loves hand-knit socks, and so I cast on a pair of socks for him. And I am using West Yorkshire Spinners. This is their owl colorway. Um... He's not a real flashy guy. He would definitely not want sparkly socks. <laughs> so this should be a good colorway for him. And as I was starting these, I mean, ordinarily these, these West Yorkshire spinners, self-patterning, striping, patterning sock yarns, I really like to do in either just a ribbing or in stockinette. I'm super tired of doing stockinette socks right now, though. I mean, I know I'm doing that, that soft side, the rose petal socks. Um, in stockinette, but that was because it was a sample and that's what kind of shows the colorway off best. But otherwise, I'm just really tired of knitting stockinette socks. So I needed to do something. So I'm actually doing um, the blueberry waffles sock pattern or the patterning from that pattern, which I don't know how well you can really see it. Uh, is it going to focus? Yeah, I don't know. Whatever. It just it's a textural thing. It gives you that waffly texture because you're doing it's a basically it's a free pattern, but you're basically just alternating stockinette rounds with ribbing rounds and it gives you that waffly texture. So I started this this morning and I made quite a bit of headway for just having started it at breakfast. I love this yarn. It's a little toothy. It's got that grab, but they're very soft once they're they're washed and everything. I think I may do the non-Euclidean on this too, although for his socks, I think I usually do a heel flap and gusset, and I know those fit him well. So I did get out this gray contrasting yarn, which is also West Yorkshire Spinners, um, and if I decide to, I may just do a regular heel flap and gusset and use this for the heel flap and heel turn and then go back to the stripe for the gusset. So we'll see. I haven't decided that yet, but I did just get it out in case that's what I decide I want to do. And these are again on US ones, high high is sharp, uh, no not sharps, just regular high highs. Um, 72 stitches for him. He's a big guy and has big feet, so he needs the 72 stitches on those. And my bag is new. I'll show you that now since I'm using it. This is a bag from Vicky at Birdleg Bags. And I don't know if you follow her on Instagram or anything, but she announced recently that she's going to be closing her shop at the end of August. 
which I'm really kind of sad. I have several of her bags. I love her bags. Um, but she's embarking on a new path, a new journey for her. She's writing books. I guess she's written her first book and it's due out to be published. I can't remember when, but yeah, if you don't follow her on Instagram, um, I would suggest doing it. She's still Bird Lake Bags on there. Uh, I don't know if she'll end up changing her username or not since she won't be making bags anymore. But um, yeah, I can't remember. She said how, how long she's been doing this and I don't remember. Um, I don't remember, but I remember when she hadn't, didn't even have a shop yet. Um, I met her actually. We got together at Panera one day, long time ago. She actually doesn't live too far from me. We've only ever managed to connect once, but um, it was so nice to meet her then and she had a bag for me and everything. And anyway, so yeah, this is one of her bags and I just thought it was super sweet. These little houses and there's cats. There's cats. Where are the cats? There's a cat. <laughs> there's a cat. There's an inchworm. I love the inchworm up on the roof of this house. And watering cans and little flowers and pears and chairs and mushrooms and suns. And look, there's stockings hanging on the line. There's such a sweet bag. And the inside is really pretty too. It's a, like a coordinating fabric. Her bags are lovely. So. <laughs> She's got a bunch left in her shop, at least she did when I ordered this, you know, within the last week. So if you're interested, check it out. I know she said she would, you know, still be putting stuff in the shop through August as she had it. I mean, I don't know. She may have, like, stuff cut out that she's going to finish sewing and putting, adding in the shop. But I assume then that will come to an end. And once they're gone, they're gone. So that was knitting. I think that's all the knitting I did this week. I, I didn't really have time to work on my design project, my, my Sunshine and Fluff Wrap working title. That won't be its final, final name. Um, I just didn't have time this week to sit down. And like I said last week, I'm at that point where I have to do some figuring out. So hopefully this week I'll get back to that. Um, I did not work on either sweater. I just haven't been in that place and I'm not pushing it. I figure I'm going to work on what's fun for me and what I wanted to work on and other things will get done eventually. Spinning. <clears throat> I finished a bobbin of the um, Unwind Yarn Company Mixed BFL. Aren't those colors lovely? I don't have very much of it left. This is all that I have left. <clears throat> and quite frankly, I probably could have spun the rest of this onto this bobbin and just made it super full, because this is definitely over half. <laughs> Look how breezy it is. It's blowing. It's funny. Um, this is definitely over half of the fiber. I did not split it in half ahead of time to try to do two bobbins to two ply it. I will probably just end up chain plying this, since it is not going to be even on two bobbins, and that'll be fine. Um, but yeah, this is... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, the Labradorite color colorway, so it's really pretty. I just I love this color. So yeah, I finished that this morning, and I will continue on. Hopefully, I'll get that finished and plied up by next week, and can show you some finished yarn. At which point, I will either go back to working on the BFL Gotland fleece. Or I may start working on the combo spin. Or I might do both. I really want to do a combo spin. I have not even let myself pick out the braids of yarn though yet. I want to finish that Unwind Yarn Company fiber first before I even go there. So we'll see. All right, uh, spinning. That was it for spinning. Um, there's no cal stuff to talk about because again, this is the no cal month, no cal August. And, um, but we do have chatter going on in several of the threads in the group. Um, there's the No Cal August thread ch um, chatter, and there's the, if you want to knit color work chatter thread, there's, I left the unofficial spin along thread open if anybody wants to chat there. Um, I can't remember what the other ones are, but whatever, any of the open threads that there are, Feel free to chatter away um, and share what you're working on this month because I enjoy seeing it and so does everybody else, I think. 
Um, I've got some new things to show you. Actually, the one you already saw was my bird leg, bird legs bag bag. Um, I have another new bag <laughs> because I was totally enabled on Instagram by the maker. This bag is by Bandit Fiber Co., which I have never purchased anything before. It's a Japanese knot bag in this really cool fabric. It's like this Ouija, Ouija board, skulls, moths, spiders, just creepy, creepy kind of motif. I just thought it was fabulous. This is going to be my official Halloween bag for this year, I believe. I have no idea if I'll do any official Halloween knitting. I have Halloween socks that have been on the needles for like two years. I should probably get those out and stick these in the bag, stick them in this bag so that I work on them. I think they're in some other Halloween bag. But anyway, I just, I really just love this fabric. And I thought it was super neat. So, bought the bag. And it's got like a purple and black check on the inside. I love these Japanese knot bags. I just think they're really fun and um, you can have it on your wrist and be working at the same time. I actually have a whole bunch of Japanese knot bags cut out that I failed to sew together correctly with the first time I tried making them. I'm gonna have to try again because they're all cut out. I was gonna use them as Christmas gifts last year and failed. So, um, we'll see. Maybe some of them will get used this year. I don't know. Um, there was that. And then one other thing, which is yarn related. Um, if you remember, I was a sponsor for the Down Cellar Studio, oh boy, words talking. Down Cellar Studio Splash Pad Party this summer, which is now over. Um, and I did remember to post all of my X Games stuff in time. So yay me. Um, anyway, a lot of the makers that were sponsors in that um, knit along offered coupon codes and also offered um, ex ex exclusive items. <sighs> Maybe my mouth needs more coffee. I don't know. Maybe it's the lipstick. It's like the lipstick's there and so my words just won't come out because they're astounded that I'm wearing lipstick. <laughs> anyway. I saw this colorway, it was one of the exclusive colorways being offered, and I saw it when that thread first went up and when she first posted it, and I was like, oh, I love that! And yet I didn't buy it until the very last day that I could use the coupon code, and actually the very last, she was offering a coupon code, but it was also the last day that this was going to be available. I don't know why I waited so long, because I knew I liked it and I wanted it, but I did. But at least I got it. Um, this is from Lilliput Yarn, and this was her exclusive colorway called Corgi Beach Day. And I'm going to take this ball band off so you can just see all the fun colors. So we've got the cor the sand, and we've got the sea here, and then all those speckles are supposed to represent the corgis. Apparently, she has a corgi, at least one, I guess, um, and she said that they have a an event near where she lives, which I don't remember where that is. Oh, Beaverton, Oregon. Never mind, it's right there on the label. Um, they do an event on the beach, and there's all the dogs running around. So that's what the little speckles represent, all the little dogs. I guess they're all corgis, I don't know. Um, running around on the beach. So anyway, I just thought this was such a fun, happy colorway. I needed it. I don't know what it'll become. It'll become part of my stash for right now, my collection. <laughs> but it was really fun. I don't know if I could do a schnauzer colorway. My schnauzer is silver, so she would be sort of boring to make a colorway from. What is the color of neuroticness? Because that would be the color I would have to put into a schnauzer colorway for my dog. <laughs> the neurotic schnauzer colorway. I still want to do a tippy colorway. I will be doing a tippy colorway sometime this fall. It's on my list of colorways. So stay tuned for that. Okay, um, that's all my new stuff. So now it's time for the Summer of Me update. Do I have my little... No, I don't. But I have it in my show notes. I did actually do some more unpacking this past week. Finally. You might notice if you look like right here... The last several weeks there has been a laundry basket sitting there 
that was a laundry basket that had stuff from my house and it's finally unpacked so yay stuff has been put away and I have another laundry basket that I can use um, but I also unpacked a bunch of boxes plus a bunch of boxes that were in the office um, which was great except the only problem is I'm at the point now where there's nowhere to go with a lot of this stuff like I was literally taking things out of boxes and just walking around the house with them saying where can I put this you know I'm opening closets looking it's like nope closing them wandering to a new spot eventually I found a place for pretty much everything the only problem is it's totally ridiculous places like not logical places for the things that I put like the cookbooks like I, I don't have a lot of cookbooks because I got rid of them because I, I mainly if I want a recipe I usually go online and look but I do have some like really basic cookbooks and some canning cookbooks and things like that that I wanted to keep um, and so those are now housed in the top of our coat closet in the living room like am I gonna remember that's where they're at I hope I do I don't know I just at candles I have stuffed in like strange little drawers places I don't I, there's just no good place to go with things didn't do any more work on the fleece like I said I'm doing other spinning right now I sewed though look I sewed a top I did post picture of this on Instagram and I will insert it here too so you can see it a little bit better but I am so happy with this top. Number one, I'm happy with it. I'm gonna try to stand up, but I have to move my coffee mug or I'll knock it over. Okay, I'm gonna try to show you, like, yeah. So it's long, like, <laughs> it, it, it goes down, it's like a tunic. It's more of a tunic than just a top, a tank top. <sighs> Lots of fabric in this. So number one, I drafted this pattern myself this was not a pattern I purchased I actually you well, okay here's the thing I was gonna make shorts I think I even talked about this last week that I wanted to make a couple pair of shorts that I was gonna draft myself from some shorts I have that I really like that are falling apart that was my original plan so I brought the fabric out here I had several different fabric options and I was gonna do this one first because I thought I had enough big enough pat pieces to do that well, I cut the first piece out, and then I couldn't find a second piece that was big enough. And I was like, well, that's not going to work. But then I thought, I was wearing, I was still in my pajamas at that point, and I had a pajama top on that is kind of shaped, the bodice at least is shaped like this. And I thought, I could do a top. And so I did. I, I drafted the top of it. Um, these are the straps I put on separately. But the top part I drafted and then it comes right to the bottom of my bust I don't know if you can tell like that's a seam there I'm sorry this is very awkward um, but yeah so that is a seam right here at the bottom of my bust I cut two pieces of this out so there's the front and then the back which the back just goes straight across I can't show you the back now I'll try to put the pictures in here the pictures aren't the greatest it's really hard to take a picture of your own back, by the way, even in a mirror. Um, anyway, but the back does it just straight across, and then there's this. But I cut two pieces of each of those out, so they are double. So there's, is that lining or facing? I guess it's facing. Um, but yeah, so super fancy. And it also, it gives a little more thickness, because this is, I don't know what kind of fabric this is. I mean, it's like a gauzy kind of fabric. But it's not what I think of as gauze. Maybe it's double gauze. I don't know. I know that's a thing, but I don't actually know what double gauze is. Anyway, the other reason I'm super excited about this top is that this is the fabric I purchased last year with the plan to make a skirt to wear to my daughter's graduation, college graduation. And I totally messed the skirt up horribly. Um, and I knew I would save it because the pieces were big enough, the fabric was enough that I could make something else, I figured. But I had forgotten that in my frustration of it failing, I totally just cut off the elastic waistband and I cut off where I had hemmed it because the hem was horrible. That was like the biggest issue. 
um, that and I had tried, I was using a pattern, but I had tried to adjust the size and I didn't accommodate the curve of the bottom of the skirt right. So it was like, oh, woo, yeah. So anyway, I made the top part and I got it fitting really nicely. And so from there, I had the two pieces left over from that skirt that didn't work out. And honestly, all I had to do was I cut off a little bit of the width because they were super wide and I knew when I attached the skirt part to this bodice um, for this sort of baby dollish look, I didn't want it to be poofy too. I mean, having a baby, like the baby doll style of top is not something that flatters me basically. So I don't tend to go that way, but I really like this. So anyway, I just didn't want it to be super full. So I took some of the width out of it, which worked great. I, you know, ran a basting stitch around the top of it so that I could gather it a little bit. And honestly, I didn't even need to gather it that much because, well, actually, I mean, I gathered it a tiny little bit, but then I ended up almost pulling most of that gather out to get it to fit onto the bodice. So I sewed it onto the bodice and because it was cut out to be a circle skirt, it, you know, it flares out. So it's super wide, um, but it's lightweight fabric it fits me perfectly like I could not get this to fit more perfectly if I had a pattern I know that the only thing if I had to say one thing is a little bit odd is there is a tiny little bit of extra fabric right here now the top that I was basing this on was made out of a knit fabric a stretchy knit this has some stretch to it but not nearly as much as the other fabric so I'm not sure if this you know, weirdness is because of that, plus the top that I was wearing was so stretched out. I mean, I've been sleeping in it for a few days, so, like, it probably wasn't the best thing for me to use for, a, you know, to draft a pattern from, but it worked. It was fine. Um, but yeah, when I put this on, and I have a, a strapless bra on underneath, you know, it fit perfect. I was so happy, aside from this little bit of puckery stuff here, which honestly when I'm wearing it and I'm moving around, you don't see it. And and this right here is a little bit loose, but I think at this point it's actually stretched out. Anyway, so I did that, put the bottom on, fit great. I cut out two straps, just basically folded them over and turned them inside out, tacked them on here, and then figured out where I wanted them in the back. I knew I wanted them to crisscross because just straps here, thin straps, never stay upright. Um, but crisscrossing them that little bit, which hopefully you saw in a picture, works perfectly. This thing is awesome. I want to make like a half dozen more of these tops before I forget what I did. I just love it so much and it's so comfortable. All right, so sewing, yay! Um, no weaving still, haven't had time to do that. I have not done any dyeing yet, the natural dyeing. Oh, <laughs> I just saw flutter outside, there's these two morning doves out in the tree. Anyway, um, I haven't, still haven't done any natural dyeing. However, I'm still learning. And if you guys watch Ninja Chicken's podcast with Maria, her most recent episode, she talked a ton about mordants and modifiers for natural dyeing. And that was a very informative episode. I need to rewatch that section because I was actually knitting at the same time that I was watching it. So, um, you know, I wasn't paying as close of attention as I probably should have, but I can rewatch it. And I had commented in her Ravelry group about it and that I was planning on doing this. And she said, you know, hey, what do you want to use? Like what material do you want to use? She was happy to help. So she has been a font of information. I can't wait to give this a try. Um, so hopefully I will have time to play with that soon. I would really like to just, just try it. I need to just dive in and try it. I, I'm still finding it a little overwhelming, but I think I'm getting a handle on things enough that I can at least give it a try. So fingers crossed. We'll, we'll give this a shot. Um, I've still been to the gym a couple of times. I haven't gone yet this week though. I think I'm going to try to go today. Today should work out. Um, <laughs> no pun intended. Still no outside activity just because, well, no bicycling or kayaking because, again, the weather has not been overly cooperative. It was beautiful this weekend, but I did not get out for that this weekend because we were doing other stuff, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, 
But as far as my little, my container garden that's over here by that building, I have started to get some tomatoes. They are so small though. They're seriously like none of them are bigger than that, like a two to three inches in diameter. They're turning red though, and they're very tasty. So I guess that's all that's important. Um, I did buy some more herb plants. I bought some more cilantro and some more dill. Um, I was at our food co-op, which is no longer super local to me, um, but I was out in that area of Pittsburgh last week. So I did go to the food co-op and picked up some more plants. I have to get them in the ground or well in the pots. I did water them yesterday though, so they're not dead yet. I just haven't had time to plant them. Um, so I guess things are going well. I'm getting edible food out of my garden and that's always, that's the point. What else? <sighs> Me time out. This is fun. Let me tell you about this. And first I have to preface it with telling you about my weekend, which um, Saturday my husband and I went to a motorcycle training course, which I think I mentioned last week that I was feeling really stressed out about it and <laughs> everything. But what was funny was the night before, Friday night, we were getting ready for bed, Bill set the alarm, because it was a little bit over a draw, hour's drive for us to get to the course in the part of Pittsburgh that it was in. And we were gonna need to get up and eat and everything. So we were getting up early. And you know what? I was not stressed out at all. I was feeling super calm and really confident about it and I thought this is gonna be good. It'll be fine. Got up Saturday morning, we got ready to go and I was still, I felt great. I made breakfast, we went, had a great drive out there. We actually drove through town, which I've never driven a motorcycle through town, but it was a Saturday morning so there was like no traffic. So that was good. Um, we did not come home through town. We came home a different route, but it was still fine. We got there. So the course was the Pro Rider um, Advanced Rider course. So this course is the, the um, combination of two half day courses put into one for a full eight hour day. It was super hot. <laughs> it was like in the mid eighties, but we were on a blacktop parking lot the whole day going at slow speeds because that's what it was slow speed maneuvering and like um evasive maneuvers emergency braking all this slow stuff so we weren't really getting that you know breeze that you get when you're riding at a faster speed um i got cooked it was funny because i knew i was going to be having my gear on i had my riding pants on with pads i had my jacket on which i had unzipped all day and my helmet but i just i had the front part of my helmet open the visor part so that I could hear more and see better. Um, well, I can see fine through it, but I had it open so I could breathe basically because it was so hot. I had not expected my face to get as much sun as it got that day. Thankfully, I was able to borrow somebody else's sunscreen because I didn't bring any. But yeah, the course was phenomenal. I cannot speak more highly of this class. I enjoyed this so much. And honestly, I've done three motorcycle training classes now different classes, very different classes. You know, the first one I did was the MSF, Motorcycle Safety Foundation, basic rider course, like for new riders. That's how I got my driver's license, my motorcycle license in Pennsylvania. If you pass the course, you get your license. Um, they endorse your permit. So that was awesome. Very good course. I felt so much more confident in my skills after I took that basic course. Um, and then the next year, no. Last year we didn't do any courses. This year in May, I talked about it already, was the Stay and Safe course that we did in West Virginia. That was a road riding course. And still, like it was two days and I learned so much um, that I still apply. Like I've, it's stuff that is applicable to every ride you ever take. Um, you know, like road positioning, where lane positioning, braking techniques in different situations, things like that. It was excellent, and again, I came away from it with a much higher feeling of confidence in my own riding skills. Same with this class. These were totally different skills on a course, not out on the road. Um, but again, slow speed maneuvering has been my nemesis. I always feel very uncomfortable and very unstable at slow speeds, and also like doing tighter turns. Um, 
breaking in general. I mean, you have to stop eventually, but I'm always a little, you know, leery. They taught us a breaking technique that I hadn't quite known about before, um, but slow speed, like learning how to be steady at a slow speed um, by utilizing your friction zone, which basically is using your your throttle and your clutch and your rear brake all at the same time to just get in this particular place. Um, it has to do with RPMs and you, like you learn to hear it, like you heard, learn to hear it for your motorcycle and that you're in that zone. There were, the parking lot was set up, and I'm sorry if this does not interest you, I'm sorry, it's my motorcycle chatter, so feel free to jump ahead, but um, the course was set up with different exercises, and like we learned one, and then you got to practice that, or they introduced one, and then you got to practice that, and then they would introduce the second one, and you'd practice that, and then you would circle back around and do the first one, and then the second one. It was set up like that to be, like you could just keep doing them all, all day long to get a lot of practice. By the end of the day, like the beginning of the day, I was really shaky and some of them I couldn't do. The first two were sort of easy. The third one, which was doing these big S turns, like well, actually not big, like smaller, tighter S turns. I was horrible at that to begin with. I got really good at these. Like by the end of the day, I felt so confident about what I was doing. Um, and then there was like doing a, this tight, I consider it tight. It was a 24 foot circle. And then there was a second one. And so we were doing a circle and then a figure eight. And you were supposed to stay inside of the cones. I never achieved staying inside of the cones completely, but I got really close. And, you know, again, I just felt very good about that. Um, I feel like I could leave now and drive and like be out in the parking lot. And if I had to do a tighter U-turn, I feel like I could do that and not feel shaky like I was going to fall over or hit a car or if I have to do a u-turn in a road I feel like I could do that and not have to you know duck walk my way around with the bike I, I just felt wonderful at the end of that day I felt I was really happy like <laughs> you know and I didn't drop my bike at all during the course which is always exciting too that was another kind of fear that I had so anyway Pro Rider has courses around the country in a lot of different locations. I will put the link for their website in the show notes. I'll put the link for all three of those ones that I mentioned in the show notes. Um, I just highly recommend, not just because I feel like they've benefited me, but because they've benefited me, and I am a new rider, but Bill has gone to all these with me, and he's been riding for over 40 years, and he has come out of all of them feeling like he's benefited from them too. So what, no matter how long you've been riding, I think continue education is always a good thing because you can always learn something. You can always be refreshed on something, no matter what it is, not just motorcycle riding. I mean, any skill that you have, you can always learn more. So that prefaces my me time story, which is I was riding high on my confidence, <laughs> my increased confidence from Saturday. And on Monday afternoon, I decided I was going to take the bike out and I was going to just ride. I was going to go. I'm trying to build up my riding time, uh, being in the saddle longer since our trip this fall is going to require me to be on the bike for a lot of hours every day. Um, so I decided I was going to take a ride. I do not like getting on the motorcycle and just going, like driving randomly. I need to have a destination. So I got on the computer and I Googled weird things to see in Pennsylvania. <laughs> and so I can't remember what the website was. It's like Roadside America or something. I'll put the link in the show notes. But it basically gave me like these things that weren't all that far from my house. They were like within an hour's drive. And so that's what I did. I went and I picked three things that were in a nice little circle that I could all hit all in the same sort of area. Um, that would let me, you know, just have an afternoon out. I did take some video footage while I was doing this, but 
it's choppy and weird. I mean, I didn't take it while I was riding. I took it when I was at these stops. Um, and it's just weird and choppy. I'm not very good at doing that kind of tour, but I will put some pictures in here as I tell you about the places that I went to. So I left here and I went to Bedford, PA, which is a little over an hour from my house, I would say. About an hour. Um, I took back roads plus part way and then I was on the turnpike because that was the most expedient way to get out there and I don't have any trouble I don't mind riding my motorcycle on the turnpike the trucks are a pain but you know whatever I'm good with that so I got to Bedford and my destination in Bedford PA was this giant coffee pot shaped building So apparently this was a thing, like back in the day when people were first starting to travel by car a lot, um, there was this trend, and I can't remember what it was called now, conceptual architecture maybe? I don't know. It was where they were building buildings that were shaped like things. Um, so there was this coffee pot, and then there was a ship that wasn't too far from here. That's since burned down. Um, there's a whole bunch of other ones, you know, and along the Lincoln Highway corridor, which is Route 30, which is in my neck of the woods, that's where some of these were built, and that's where the coffee pot was built. Um, it has since been moved. It used to actually be a coffee shop, and then later it was turned into a bar. It's been since moved across the street and is sort of in front of the fairgrounds at this place. Um, so I found it, I actually passed it up. You would think, how can you pass up a large coffee pot? But I managed to. I didn't see it till I was passing it. So I turned around, came back. So I will put pictures in here, hopefully, of the giant coffee pot building. Um, one of the really fun things as I was peeking in the windows, there was some chairs in there and tables, and I don't know, they must use it for certain things, but the one chair had a sign on the, on the back of it that said, quilters only. What the heck was that all about? Quilters only in the coffee pot house? I don't know. So anyway, so it was my first destination. Um, I left there and basically headed down the road and I was on Route 30 pretty much the rest of the day um, or the rest of my outing. I went to Man's Choice PA, M-A-N-N-S, um, to find the Ron's Antique radio museum I think it's there's more to that name it's like radio museum and 50s place or something I don't know um, basically it's this guy who he's in his 70s and he restores antique radios um, he's been doing this all his life and he's got this little building on his property like his house is right next door and it was a, a building full of radios. I do have a little video clip that I will try to put in here that shows you the inside of the place. Okay, so you are the proprietor and your name again is Ron, right? Ron. And he's got all kinds of really cool stuff in here. And you get to keep company, right? <laughs> I'm going to have to tell my husband about this. We're going to have to come out sometime. He would love it. Oh, well, everybody needs one of those. That's really cool. Well, I'm glad that this ended up being on my route of fun things to do today. She can also show you what's out front there. It was so cool. I ended up spending probably an hour there. I had not anticipated being there that long. But he was very chatty and shared all kinds of information with me, told me all kinds of things about the different radios. It was a lot of fun. Um, and his wife came in at one point and, you know, she gave me this beaded spider. She must make them and give them to people. And it was so cute because she had it in her hand. She's like, here, hold out your hand. I'm like, <laughs> so I did and she put it in my hand. I got home and I handed it to my husband. I'm like, look here. And he's like, oh, cool. And then he took it. I don't know what he put it, where he put it though. So I can't show you the spider, but it was really cool. Anyway, so she came in and he's like, oh, well, she'll show you the rest of the stuff. I'm like, there's more. So she took me outside and there were some things outside on the porch. And then she took me over to their garage, which is aside from being their garage, it also has 
more radios and it's also I think his workshop area so she told me about more of the radios that were out there and some of them were really cool because they're like things and some of them I do remember like from when I was younger like there was like a Tweety Bird radio and a Big Bird radio and there was a radio that looked like a cannon I said oh that's our last name so I took a picture of the cannon radio um yeah it was just really cool so as I was talking to her we were talking about hobbies and different things and I said yeah well I'm a knitter I said so I've got stuff all over the place too because I said something about it. wow did you know what you were getting into when you married this guy with all his radios and anyway I said you know I'm a knitter and I've got yarn everywhere and she's like let me show you my shed <laughs> like okay so we went to the next little building and there was another shed a she shed she opened the door and all her crafting stuff was in there she's got a giant quilting loom is that what it's called a quilting frame whatever you put a big quilt in to do the quilting she's got one of those in there and her sewing machine she had a stack of afghans she's crocheted and um yeah just all kinds of crafty stuff so I stood in there and talked with her for a while about different crafting things and I told her what I do and it was just it was fun so it was just very nice to meet both of them I love that when you go someplace and you have this unexpected encounter with people that you would not have expected having so it was it was just a lot of fun um, so yeah I was there way longer than I had anticipated but that was fine so I left there and my next stop was like the next town down which was Shellsburg PA and the only thing I was there to see was a gas pump. It was an antique gas pump that has been painted to look like Starry Night, Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night with Vincent Van Gogh on the front of the pump holding the gas nozzle and hose. <laughs> like not the actual one on the pump but like just a picture of him. I will put a picture in here. Isn't that cool? Vincent Van Gas is what it says. Um, I can't remember what the story is for why that was painted that way. It was part of some sort of a project, you know, like an art project or something. It's um, situated in front of an actual garage, which also had a historical marker on it. Um, again this being on the Lincoln Highway which is a historical roadway in our area and so I read the sign about this garage and it was very interesting I learned a fact I did not know before it was talking about how back in the day when again when people were first buying automobiles and you know personally owning their own automobiles this was at a time where obviously really nobody had garages because they would not have had a reason to have a garage. They might have had a barn where they kept their horses or their buggy or whatever, but they didn't necessarily have a place to keep their cars and early cars needed to be kept inside, you know, where they would get ruined. Um, so people started building garages, which were basically places that other people could rent space to keep their cars in. So that's what the original purpose of a garage was. When we hear garage now, it's like I'm taking my car to the garage to get fixed. The whole aspect of providing service for fixing and maintaining cars, that came later. People who had these garages for people to keep their cars in then started you know, offering those kind of services. I just thought that was very interesting that that was a secondary thing. Who knew? I did not know that. So that was very cool. Another tidbit of information that um, Ron from the radio place had told me, because he was pointing out different radios and he was telling me like what the prices of some of them were new when they were brand new. And he's like, yeah, that one was $300. That one would have been $500. And he said, what you have to understand is back at that time, for just a couple hundred dollars more, you could have bought a new car. <laughs> So that really put it in perspective. He's like, yeah, rich people were the people who owned radios and cars. Like, nobody who was poor owned a radio back in those days. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, now we have cars that have radios and satellite and everything else in it. And pretty much everybody owns a car and a radio. So, I don't know. Times change. Anyway, so those were my three stops. And it was a lot of fun. Okay. <laughs> I need to re-record part of what I just recorded because, because, <laughs> um, however, I did, I 
just left the room for a minute and I did actually find my spider. <laughs> this is the beaded spider that um, that woman gave me. Isn't it cute? It's just like something so random. She said it's meant to be like a, you know, a Christmas tree ornament so you can put a hook on it. So he'll be gracing our Christmas tree, I guess. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I started talking about this and then I really rambled. So I'm going to just try again. Um, after I did the Vincent Van Gast stop, I was riding home via Route 30, which is the Lincoln Highway, um, historical roadway. And I don't, I don't drive that part of Route 30 very often. And so I'd kind of forgotten that I was going to be passing right by the Flight 93 Memorial. Flight 93 was one of the planes that was, um crashed on 9-11 which I'm not going to go into a whole bunch of that because that's where I got tangled up a little bit ago and it just started into a big long ramble um, all that to say is that is very close to where I live obviously um, I have never been to that memorial site before I've not purposely not gone but I've purpose not also not purposely gone like I haven't gone out of way, my way to go mainly just because every time I think about it I start thinking about that day and start thinking about, you know, about that day. Personally, like how that affected me, my kids, you know, my family, just memories. All kinds of memories wrapped into that. And it's hard and it's emotional, even this long after, you know. Um, so I just have never been sure that I've really wanted to go see that. Um, I've never been to Ground Zero for the same reason. Of course, Ground Zero is quite a bit away from me. I have seen the Pentagon um, when they were actually reconstructing the area that was damaged. Um, but anyway, I, I rode past it as I, I saw the signs and I, I went past it and I thought, yeah, you know, I need to get home. And then I got a little ways down the road and I stopped. I pulled into a parking lot. And I thought, you know what? I'm out here. I'm just going to go. So I turned around, I went back, and I did go back into the memorial. You have to drive about three and a half miles off Route 30 to get back in there. There is a visitor center, which I did not go to because of time. Plus, I think it was maybe even closed at that point. Um, but the rest of it is open sunrise to sunset. I mean, it's part of the National Park Service now. Um, so I got back in there, and it was not what I was expecting. I thought it was like, a memorial like a statue but it's not it's a plaza a memorial plaza that is actually built along the edge of the debris field from where the plane was wrecked um, there's a lot of stuff commemorating the passengers and crew from that flight who were killed um, that was hard to see um, but also very good to remember you know, people died there, <laughs> and it's just sobering, very sobering. It was very quiet there. There were quite a few people there, um, which seems so odd being, like, out in the middle of nowhere, really. I mean, you are basically out in the middle of this field. Um, but, you know, there were just a lot of people there visiting. It was very interesting. There's different areas where people left their own little tokens of memory and um, I did take some video footage of the area and of the memorial and the, the marble slabs that have everybody's name on it but you know what I'm not gonna post that um, for a lot of different reasons but I just feel like it's um, pers it's not personal to me like I didn't know anybody on that flight but it feels like a very personal thing. And I know that sounds weird because it's someplace anybody can go. And I, you know, if that's your thing and you want to go to it, you're around the area, go and experience it. I, it was very cool to see um, as much as any type of memorial of that type can be cool. I guess cool is probably not the right word. It's hard to put my feelings about it into words, quite frankly, is what I'm saying. And that's why I'm re-recording this part because I rambled for way too long and didn't say anything well the first time. Um, but 
that was an unofficial fourth stop on my day of riding, um, which definitely was not in the category of weird and quirky things in Pennsylvania to see. Um, but it is historical, um, as were the other three stops. I mean, they're maybe not, you know, your highbrow historic kind of things, but they all had historic meaning. Um, so I enjoyed my ride and from there I did leave there much later. I spent a lot more time there than I thought I would because again I thought I was going back and going to see like the statue but I was there for quite a while because it's this it's a large area so I was walking around a lot um, and so by the time I was getting ready to leave it was like six o'clock or maybe after six so I texted my husband I'm like hey I'm I'm coming home honest <laughs> you might want to start dinner before I get there or we're gonna be eating really late and I had already gotten stuff out of the freezer and everything so I told him what to do but um yeah so I drove home the rest of the way on route 30 which is a nice it's just a lot of hills because you oh my gosh that was really awesome actually um because you're going to the top of some of the mountains in the range you know and so I hit, I went past several summits, um, which at the top of the one summit, there's all these um, wind turbines. And you're just up there, and it's just wind, the sea of wind turbines, which is so cool. There was no good place for me to stop and pull over and take a picture, um, but it was neat to see. And what else? Yeah, it's just a lot of like steep hills and sharp curves. Basically, there's all these warning signs, especially for trucks, and I love riding my motorcycle on those kind of roads. <laughs> Maybe that sounds weird because I get weirded out about other stuff. I don't like coming in my driveway, but I love riding, you know, steep hills and sharp curbs are my thing. So, yeah, rode home, got home, had a good day. It was just, it was a really good ride. So, hopefully I'll get a chance to do more things like that. Um... I would love to just do that every day, but obviously can't because, you know, work. <laughs> okay, so that was my me time out this week. Um, and that's pretty much the end of 90% I've got for you this week. Um, shop news, oh, I guess it's the end of 10% too. Shop news, I am having an update on Friday. It's going to be all self-striping. I can't possibly show you everything because there's so much. I may end up doing just like a little quick like slideshow that I've like I did before um, to show you everything. But everything is up in the shop. Well, no, it's not. I'm sorry, that's a lie. <laughs> Hopefully, by the time this video is up, though, I'll have everything up in the shop. I've taken all the the pictures, um, but I'll be putting everything up in preview mode. I also, in addition to the self striping, which is going to be on fingering weight. Um, and I've got some on sport weight and also some on DK and worsted weight. So there's a lot of different self-striping. Um, in addition to, you know, the show leftover self-striping, I also did dye up some restocks of the soft side colorways that I introduced in the shop last week. Again, thank you so much to everybody who was enthusiastic about those. A bunch of um, things sold out, so I have replenished those. Um, any of the things I'm replenishing will not show up in the shop until the update goes live at 6 p.m. on Friday. So the listings are still up there for all four of those soft side colorways, um, but anything that's sold out will still remain sold out until I put the, the restock items in at 6 p.m. on Friday. So just so you know that. Um, otherwise... Um, I will be adding, I, I have all the pictures taken of like the fiber that I've got, some sock blanks I've got. I do have some expanded rainbow sock blanks that I'll be putting in the shop along with some other like resist dyed and different sock blanks. I think I only have one hand painted um, big flower sock blank left, but I'll be putting those in. Um, I've got a few different kits I think I'm going to be putting in. Those, I'm just going to be put them, putting them in and adding them as I can. They're not going to be waiting for the update. Um, so whether I get them in before the update or right after, I don't know, but you can look for those as well. I will post on Instagram and let you know when those things are in the shop. Um, I need to mention this. I keep forgetting the last two weeks I've meant to mention this. The Conversion Rewards Program. In August, I'm offering bonus rewards. This is what I've been forgetting to mention. Now, I will say I have posted this in the group. 
for the Fabric and Dye Works group in the Conversion Rewards program, the main thread. That's where I'm posting this kind of stuff. So that's like your primary place if you're taking part in this. Check back there because if I'm doing something special, that's where you'll hear, hear about it first. But I have been meaning to mention it on here too. So in the month of August, anybody who posts one, at least one qualifying finished object, it just has to be one. Um, if you post more, that's fine, but you're only going to get the bonus one time. Um, and if you post a finished, I'm reading it so that I don't get this wrong, a finishing, a finished project in the month of August, I originally had said between August 1st and August 15th, but since I have forgotten to mention this on here, I'm going to just extend it through the entire month of August. So if you finish a finished object that qualifies for the Conversion Rewards Program um, in the month of August, all the way through, you will earn 50 bonus point, bonus grams, not bonus points. So that's all it takes. Just finish one project and add it to your finished object post, and I will award you 50 bonus grams at the end of the month. Or, well, yeah, probably at the end of the month. I'll just do them all at one time. Um, so yeah, again, I have that written in the thread. So if you want to read it fully there, but that's the main gist of it. Um, in order to have your finished object qualify though, please include your posting date for that object when you put it up. That's not usually something that you need to include in your finished object post, but since I can't tell when something's being posted, um, since you're adding to the same thread over and over, I do need you to put your posting date in there um, so that I can know that it qualifies. If you don't put a posting date in there, I won't know that it qualifies. So that has to be in there. Um, lastly, I just wanted to mention upcoming vending things. I'm, again, I'm kind of in my downswing for vending right now, but coming up this fall, I am vending a couple different places. Needles Up Rhinebeck, which will be the Friday before Rhinebeck, so that is the 19th of October. Um, the general hours are from 1 to 6 p.m., <laughs> so, and all that information um, is on my website. Then in November is Indy Knit and Spin here in Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area. Um, that's at the Ace Hotel again um, in East Liberty. So that will be on the 11th of November. That's a Sunday this time, not a Saturday. So note that change. And that is from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And looking into 2019, which I know is a long way away, but I just thought I'd mention it. I'll be vending at Stitches United in Atlanta in May, that May-June weekend, May 30th through June 2nd. How cool is that? I've never done a Stitches event before, so I'm really looking forward to doing that. Okay, I think that's everything. I have no idea how long this podcast is going to be because I need to do a whole bunch of editing, <laughs> cutting things out and putting things together. But I think I've hit all the high spots at this point, plus some. Um, anyway, until I talk to you next time, have a great week, and I will see you later. Bye.